Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Praise the Lord. Folks, I'll tell you what, Thanksgiving weekend, you know what I'm most thankful for? I'm thankful that we serve a God that is more powerful than any force in this universe. I am thankful that God takes care of every single situation that we have because he cares. He's big enough to be the protector of this world, but small enough to fit into our hearts. But that's mighty, isn't it? Praise the Lord. How many have ever seen the movie um, A Few Good Men? There's an interesting storyline there. It, it kind of goes like two Marines were accused of killing another Marine on, on Guantanamo Bay. And uh, this Lieutenant Caffey uh, is tasked with defending them. And there is a whole system that seems to be coming against them. And it ends up that uh, Colonel Jessup is the one that seems to be the one that is stirring up most of the problems uh, when it comes to uncovering the truth. So let me tell you something. Can you handle the truth? I love what uh, John Eldridge says about this. You know, how many of you realize that there's a pattern that goes on with Hollywood, with books that you read, with myths, fairy tales, all of that stuff, where there seems to be a consistent theme. There's a tragedy, there's an adventure, there's a villain, and there's a hero. And the hero comes right at the end to rescue the day. And we're all hoping that the enemy gets his due. Do you, you end up seeing that? I mean, I want you to pay attention to that. Here's what John Eldred says. I want you to notice that all the great stories pretty much follow the same storyline. Things are once good, then something awful happened, and now a great battle must be fought or a journey taken. At just the right moment, which feels like the last possible moment, a hero comes and sets things right, and, in, and life is found again. We can solve problems in just an hour shell. And it's simply amazing. I wish life would be like that, right? <laughs> and we could solve those problems. He says, there is a story that we just can't seem to escape, though. There is a story written on the human heart. And Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has planted eternity in the human heart. So there's something that motivates the entire creative community to actually put this theme in every story because God has placed eternity in our hearts. So whether you're saved or not, you tend to in, in, we're involved in a greater story. It is the story of God. It is the story of a villain, and it is a story of a hero. And we serve the hero of the story. John Eldridge says this, Life is very confusing if you do not take into account that there is a villain, that you, my friend, have an enemy. You have an enemy. I knew I was going to be preaching Thanksgiving weekend, and I had something else that was prepared, but once I listened to what Pastor Ryan was saying um, on homosexuality and the battle that is really waging, this hit my heart. And I want to I share this humbly with God's protection and power. And there's a reason we're praying for that. Because today I want to talk to you about the truth about Satan. I want us to understand what we are facing as an enemy. If you don't believe we're in a war, look within your hearts. Look within society. Look in with what is happening in our world today. And we need the God of this universe. We need a God who fights our every battle, who wins every single battle. Do you realize that there is nothing he can't do? Actually, I, 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 there is something that he can't do. You know, somebody had said this one time that God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. But there's one thing he can't do. 
You know what that is? Please everybody. Because his desire would be for everyone to come to repentance. So today we're going to expose Satan's strategy. First, we want to talk about his origin. Where did he come from? In Isaiah 14, and he was a beautiful angel. And it's described here, How you have fallen from heaven, O shining star, son of the morning. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb, I will climb to the highest heavens and be like the most high. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. Folks, we're going to share a lot of scripture here. And uh, before you panic, everything is on the after-sermon notes. We gave you every scripture and every point is on the after-sermon notes, so you don't have to hurry to take notes. I just want you to focus, and I want you to listen, and I want you to hear what God is saying to you and to us as a church today. In Ezekiel 28, it says, Then this further message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, sing this funeral song for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the sovereign Lord. It's interesting, I I read that and it said the king of Tyre. It's like, but what is described here is in heaven and in the battle that has happened here. But then I look at the commentary and it says Ezekiel was describing Satan, who was the true king of Tyre. The one motivating the human ruler of Tyre. Give him this message from the Sovereign Lord. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone. Red carnelian, pale green peridot, white moonstone, blue green beryl, onyx, green jasper, blue lapis lazuli, turquoise and emerald, all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I adorned, ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. Your rich commerce led you to violence and you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, O mighty guardian, from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. You defiled your sanctuaries with your many sins and your dishonest trade. So I brought fire out from within you, and it consumed you. I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All who knew you are appalled by your fate. You have come to a terrible end and will exist no more. And then finally in Revelation 12, there's a great war that has been described. There was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels. And the dragon, this is great, the dragon lost the battle. And he and his angels were forced out of heaven. This great dragon, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, the one deceiving the whole world, was thrown down to the earth with all his angels. Then I heard a loud voice shouting across the heavens, It has come at last, salvation and power, and the kingdom of our God, and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters have been thrown down to earth, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, but you who live in the heavens rejoice. But terror... Terror will come on the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you in great anger, knowing that he has little time. The NIV, it uses the phrase, filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. 
So you football fans, how many of you know what the two-minute drill is? It's when you're behind and then two minutes left to go and you have to hurry. I don't know why teams don't do that all the time. You know, it's like, oh, it's two minutes. Now we have to hurry up and get moving. But what do we do? We're desperate. Something is happening. The time is getting short. And so we try harder. And if you can imagine the enemy that we face, that his time is short and he knows it. And he is filled with great fury. We need not mistake in that. That he does not like you. He doesn't like what you represent. He doesn't like the fact that you are created in the image and likeness of God. He doesn't like that Jesus came and died for us. He wanted, he, he wanted us for his own. Don't dismiss his power, but don't slander him either. Just understand who God is in the midst of all of that. So what is his mission? What is Satan's mission here? And this is kind of odd, isn't it, when we talk about a Thanksgiving weekend. But again, what I'm thankful for is God is the greatest force in the universe. And he has already defeated and will continue to defeat the enemy. Amen? And we're following in line of Pastor Ryan's series. So there were two stories of direct impact that we see in Scripture. And the first one, actually both of them we kind of know. The first one is in Genesis 3, where it says, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. The woman was convinced that she was being lied to so that she did rejected what the serpent was saying and went to seek out God and Adam, and they went and lived happily ever after. Don't you wish that was the end of the story? We wouldn't be here, would we? <laughs> but the sad words is the woman was convinced. Perfect creation, convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. What a tragic story, isn't it? Doubt filled with her own thoughts. But let's take a look at another story in Matthew 4. This is the story of Jesus. Who do you think is going to win this one? It says, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For forty days and nights he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came to him and said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus told him, No, the Scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple, and said, If you are the Son of God, jump off, for the Scriptures say... Is it not powerful that sometimes all scriptures are not ordained of God? The truth is there, but it depends on how you use it. And in this case, he's using it to trap Jesus. But the scriptures say, He will order his angels to protect you and will hold you up with their hands so they won't even hurt your foot on a stone. But Jesus responded, The scriptures also say, you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give it all to you, he said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, what seems to be the common thing that Jesus always says, the scriptures say, you must not worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. What's the difference between these two stories? And you can see it. With Eve, 
what the serpent said worked. Through doubt and listening to herself outside of God, she took in that doubt and then she sinned. But with Jesus, it did not work. Do you know why? The difference is he stood on God's word. He stood on the truth of God. He did not waver. Even when other scriptures were thrown at him, he stayed strong on what his father was saying. Now, you don't think the enemy can come and influence you, right? Because he came to two perfect people. Eve was perfect at the time, and Jesus. And the biggest difference is standing on the word. Amen? I want you to note something. God didn't tell Adam and Eve that the serpent would come. He didn't say there's a great enemy that's coming against you. He just gave them the word. He gave them his truth. Folks, we don't have to always glorify the enemy. We just stand on his word. It's not all about the enemy all the time. And you see people always talking to the, to the enemy, you know. You are some filthy, get out of my... You know, it's like, okay, whatever. Folks, do you know that there was two times in Scripture, one in Jude and one in 1 Peter, where it says not even the archangel Michael dared bring a slanderous accusation against the devil, but said the Lord rebuke you. When you look at Jesus, Jesus didn't talk to the enemy until he said, get out, and reciting Scripture. He didn't get lost in it, and we get lost sometimes. But Jesus is always the way, he's always the truth, and he's always the life, and he'll always bring us back into peace. He'll always bring us back into power whenever we're tempted and whenever the enemy tries to bring us out from God's will. Jesus stood on the word, and it's all about the word. And I want to say something here. How victorious we are depends on how well we stand on God's truth. How victorious we are in our lives will depend on how we stand on God's truth. Satan's mission is threefold, I really believe. And there's three words, twist, taint, and turn. He wants to twist God's word, and you see him trying to do it. And sometimes you'll hear scriptures in your head. Have you ever heard scriptures in your head and you just got anxious? And it kind of disturbed you and it confused you? I'm going to tell you something. God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. When he speaks the scripture, it hits the heart. But the devil can use scripture too, as we've seen in Jesus' day. And then it gets pounded over and over and over and over and over and over again. You know it's not ordained of God. It is still the word, but it doesn't set us free. The difference between God's word and anything else is that the word sets us free. A lie binds us. And we have to understand that. No matter what we're facing, he twists God's word. He taints God's character. Tries to make God someone he's not. And then he wants to turn us from God. That's his ultimate goal, right? Turn us from God. He ruined us in the Garden of Eden. And he wants to pull us from God. So let's move on to this primary tool. I think there's only one word of his tool. Because Satan can't touch you. He can't touch you. Unless it's by influence. Satan's primary tool is influence. Listen to me carefully. Here is the reality. And I've got this recorded so you cannot deny I'm about to say this. But I want to say something to you that is hopeful. But at the same time sobering. Satan has no power over us that we don't give him. He has no power. He can't do a thing until we open the door. Even with Cain, remember Cain? The first family right out of the Garden of Eden. Cain's very not happy with his brother. And there's a lot of anger inside. And and God recognizes it. And I love that part of the story. He says, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must what? Master it. What God was saying is it's not the anger itself, it's the impulse. If you open that door, you're going to be in trouble. And guess what Cain did? He opened the door. We have a choice, folks. We are not bound by the lies. We're not bound by the deceit. We're not bound by the things that Satan throws at us. We 
are created in the image and likeness of God, and we have his word to stand on. Amen? Amen. Our greatest warning becomes our greatest hope. How successful he is depends on us. It depends on you. When Jesus, uh, he was talking to some people and the Jews, he said this as they were continuing a conversation here. It says, Jesus told them in John 8, If God were your father, you would love me because I have come to you from God. I am not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do the evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. Listen carefully. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. Wow. He has always hated the truth because there is no truth in him. And the Bible says that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So which one do you want to serve today? You want to serve a God who's a God of light and has all the truth? You want to serve an enemy that has no truth whatsoever and his only mission is to pull you away from your genuine devotion of God? It's got quiet. Are you okay? When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So when I tell the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. How many belong to God? I can't believe it's that few. How many belong to God? All right. Do you believe the words of God? And you stand on that truth and you don't let the enemy down. You don't let the enemy get through to you. The bottom line is this. The devil works by influencing people. Okay? Two ways. He operates best when what he spreads is unchecked by the word. He works his best. So he can influence us individually. Okay? He shows the short-term benefit versus the long-term consequence. How many have heard that statement before? You know, he will show you how to benefit from whatever it is you want to do, but he will never show you the long-term consequence. And that's why God wants to protect us with his word. But he also influences collectively. He influences us through social contagion. It's sort of like how, how, when you look at the world today, a lot of people follow the crowds. When you look at two particular stories, remember the ten spies in the book of Exodus, it's like God was giving them the promised land, and the land was theirs, and they sent out the twelve spies, and ten of them came back and kept putting on Facebook, this isn't good. <laughs> See, Facebook for them was the community, right? They were close-knit, and they just spread the stuff around. And guess what? The ten spies won. And people stop believing God. The God that brought them to the promised land. Folks, God brings us to deliverance. He brings us to his power. Don't believe the lies. Well, I don't know if God's going to do that. I don't know if he loves me. I don't know if he can you know, really deliver me from this. I've been in this for so long. I don't know if I can do it. I, you know, God isn't with me. He's never there. He's always, something's always happening to me. And I just can't seem to trust in a God that just lets bad things happen all the time. And you see the lies? And it goes to our head. And the only thing to combat that lie is the truth of God that he is with you. And he will never leave you or forsake you. He will deliver you. Now, maybe, maybe not in the way that we want it to happen. I love Ephesians 3.20. He's able to give immeasurably more than what we could ever ask or imagine. Whatever you think God wants to do in your life, God's already got something better. Don't, even, don't, don't. Listen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It is getting God's understanding. Amen? But he influences us collectively. Look at Barabbas. You know, Pilate did not want 
to crucify Jesus. And so he said, well, maybe we can just set this little thing up. I think we can win this and get the people to choose Jesus over Barabbas. But somebody manipulated them. Man, social media has nothing over them. They spread the word so much that when it was time to choose Jesus or Barabbas, they yelled, Barabbas! The naive people that didn't see who Jesus was. But when he was on the cross and he says it is finished and that curtain was torn and now we have free access to God the Father, we see Jesus now. We know who Jesus is. We know the power of God through Jesus and his resurrection, his resident within you. Do not let the enemy get through to you. Whether it be an addiction or anxiety or depression or lies, anything in our lives, conflict. He wants to destroy everything that God has installed. Just take a look at society. Can I step on some toes? I'm just amazed. Societal influences are directly an attack on God's plan and creation. You look at pornography and the scourge of pornography and you see the destruction of sexuality. You look at the sexual revolution where sex now is everywhere and it seems to be okay, even in the church with single people. I say stay celibate so the power of God can rest on you. Life itself is on trial with abortion and genocide. Are we speaking the truth or not? Gender confusion. The last time I checked the word, he created us male and female. And now I heard just last week there was 130 different genders. But do you see how the enemy knows how to bring God's creation down? Same-sex marriage, homosexuality, suicide, drug use. He's destroying us, folks. Addiction. He wants us bound so that we do not serve God. It is amazing to me when you look at the scourge of fentanyl all across this country. And we're not doing anything to stop it. We just allow the enemy to come in and we're going to destroy our nation. It is time that we stand on the original creation of this country, which is the God that we serve today. Amen. But the enemy has us collectively going downhill. And God does not want it. Amen. Amen. There's one other thing to expose about Satan's influence. It is subtle and desensitizing. I have never heard of anybody get a knock on the door and it was Satan. And said, you know what? I want to influence you right there. (laughs) I want to make you do something. Because if, if that were to happen, you would say, no, I recognize you. I recognize the serpent. Now, hopefully we would recognize the serpent, right? But the problem is today he works slowly in desensitizing us what we accept today we would never accept 40 years ago what we are accepting in our lives we would never accept well maybe not all of us are over over 40 but anyway just think of your life and where you were when you first accepted Christ and then even the church we are bringing things in that we should not be bringing in we have to stand on the word all right, I got to move on. Our focus. What should we do now to, 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 to really curtail what the enemy is doing? Wow, I got to move. Is it okay we're here until two? Okay. I'll, I'll try to hurry. What is our focus? What should we do? Number one, well, 
This is so important here, but the first one is critical thinking with God's word in focus. It is time that we don't buy every thought that comes into our minds. It is time that we don't, we don't subscribe to every idea that comes down the pike. It is time that everything is measured with God's word in focus. I don't know why it is that we can have media in our country that tells us what to believe, and we believe it. But we need to believe the word of God before anything else. Challenge everything. Don't believe everything you hear. I got to tell you something. I'm going to shock you here. Are you all sitting down? Not everything on the internet is accurate. Is that a shocker or what? Not everything you hear is accurate. Check everything by the word. Stand on the word. Check things out. Secondly, we need to know the word. We have critical thinking with the word in focus, but you have to know. You have to study, and you have to stay in the word every single day. Drink it up. I've loved it throughout my whole Christian life. It's really a fascinating thing. I mean, I don't care how you do it. Just stay in it. Make three by five cards. Get the strength in you, because it is, it is your salvation through anything you're going to face. But you've got to know it, because God is not a God of confusion, but the enemy will confuse you. The enemy wants to confuse you. He wants to confuse you, just like Eve. Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Number three, recognize where we are vulnerable and strengthen those areas. Where are you vulnerable? Everybody has a different weakness. What may tempt you is not going to tempt me. What you go through is different than what your partner's going through. What you're going through is different than what your friends are going through. And the enemy knows exactly how to attack you and your vulnerabilities. He is a coward, and he will never come to you in your strengths. He always comes to us in our weakness. And it is about time that when he comes to us to show us our weakness, that we recognize it and we say, Jesus is my deliverer. And it may take time, but I'm going to stay in the Lord. That's exciting. And number four, don't follow crowds that don't subscribe to God's truth. Do not follow crowds that do not subscribe to God's truth. You see, God and his truth is not defined by any worldly philosophy, organization, government, or human wisdom. God is not independent, he is not Democrat, he's not Republican, he is the God, he is the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. And the one thing we have to do as a nation, and the one thing we have to do as a church, is we have to stand on that word. I just love that. It excites me. Because I don't have to worry about what's happening in our country. Because I know what's happening with my God. And yes, in Romans 13, it does say that all leaders were ordained of him. So in other words, God may be giving us what we deserve. Because if he doesn't, I, I'll go on. Okay, never mind. I don't want to get too deep in those weeds. Okay, I want to close with some takeaways. What do we need to do? And the first takeaway is this. Refuse to be led astray. Refuse. Take in the word so much that you're going to recognize when a lie comes. You know what counterfeiters, uh, people who, you know, recognize counterfeits, they're trained to do what? Recognize the original. When you recognize the original, you can spot a counterfeit in in a minute. Or maybe even a couple seconds, right? You don't spend all your time studying all these different counterfeits because you'll get confused. And when you get confused, you won't know what is right and what is wrong. And I am saying to you, just like they they would teach, and that's the word trained that way, is that we know the word. Don't worry about the human philosophies. Don't worry about what Satan is saying. Don't worry about what's going on, but you believe the word. And when you believe the word, you will recognize something. That is wrong immediately. And your spirit connected to God will tap you on the shoulder and say, that's not true. Because we're standing on the standard of God's word. 
2 Corinthians 11, I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as pure bride to one husband, Christ. But I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent. The NIV says, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion. 1 John 3, dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil who has been sinning from the beginning. But listen to this. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. That's the reason Jesus came, was to destroy the works of the devil. So in order to not be led astray, we need a firm foundation to stand on. We need an anchor to hold us steady from all the shifting tides of this world. And it is his word. It is his steady devotion to Christ. It is healthy biblical community. We need each other to sharpen each other. And that's why Pastor Ryan has such a strong emphasis on small groups. Because what Satan wants to do is isolate you. And if he can isolate you, he can confuse you. But I tell you what, there's strength in numbers, isn't there? There's somebody to be able to say, don't believe that. It doesn't sound true to me. All right? Don't be led astray. Number two, submission to God. We need to submit ourselves to God. And here's the scripture in James 4. It says, and he gives grace generously. As the scriptures say, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. The NIV says, submit yourself before God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. What God wants us to do is to submit to him, to be humble. Then we will resist the devil. Don't try to do the opposite. Have you ever tried to resist the devil but not submit to God? And we're going to talk about that in the last takeaway. Humility and submission must always come before resisting the devil. Next, be self-controlled and alert. Man, we got to keep our eyes open. One of my favorite scriptures, 1 Peter 5, 8. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. You know what devour means in the original language? It means to drink. <laughs> I love that. It means to swallow. The connotation is this. He wants to eat us up. He wants to consume us by eating. He wants to make sure that we are eliminated. The NIV uses those two terms, be alert and of sober mind. And the word self-control means to be sober-minded. Watchful, circumspect, circumspect, to exercise self-restraint, to act and think soberly. It is so fascinating that the opposite of what they're talking about in self-control is drunkenness. I find that interesting because what happens is God is saying, do not drink the philosophy of this world. Don't become Drunk on what you hear. Become sober-minded. Stay sober. And the second thing is to stay alert. Stay alert. Because you know what the enemy is doing, right? It means to arise, arouse, to watch, to refrain from sleep. It denotes attention, to be watchful and vigilant. So in other words, if I were to put it in, in layman's terms here, what God is saying is don't be drunk or asleep. Don't be drunk on things other than God and stay awake, stay alert. The enemy's coming after you. And you know when you see it. His whole design is to devour and destroy souls. Next, be strong in the Lord. So we have submission to God. We have, now we've got to grow. We've got to be strong in the Lord. We have to put on our protection. We have to recognize what the real enemy is. And we look at Ephesians 6, a final word. It says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. 
Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. The NIV says, stand against the devil's schemes. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. I have news for you. We are not the enemy. This is not the enemy. We are God's creation. We're supposed to be together. But the enemy will try to divide us and isolate us. And and there's no way that we're going to allow that to happen. And that's why we exist as a church. And that's why other churches exist as well. But listen to this. I, I really love this. When it comes to the devil's schemes versus the power of God, there's no contest. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? The devil's schemes and the power of God, if we put them in a, in a, in a place and they had to fight it out, there's no contest there. All right? God wins every single time. Jesus overcame any attempt to destroy him because he stayed in the word. And listen to this. God's great wisdom is that he allowed Satan to kill Jesus, not realizing because of his great pride that it led to his own demise. The devil is that stupid that he would buy into it. But he did it because God wanted to trap him and he is going to get rid of him forever and ever and we're going to be in a new heaven and a new earth and we're never going to have any sin anymore and you're not going to feel depressed anymore. You're not going to be anxious anymore. There will be no addiction. There will be no sickness. There will be no sin because we'll all be for the rest of eternity with God and each other. That's what he hates, right? Satan hates it, that we are free people. Listen to this, though. It's, Jesus said seven words, I thought, were absolutely powerful. You know, the 72 were casting out demons, and they came to him. They were really excited. Jesus, they actually submit to us. And he said these seven words. They're not on your screen. Luke ten eighteen. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. You're not reacting. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Does anybody see lightning? Yeah, it's pretty powerful, isn't it? The next time you see a lightning bolt, understand that Satan fell out of heaven that quickly. It's sort of like God spoke. Boom, you're done. (laughs) That wake anybody up. Do you realize how the power differential is, is there? I'm just so amazed. And even though you may live in darkness, even though you might have things that you're dealing with and you're wrestling with, the power of God still rests on you. And he's more powerful than anything. Okay, I'm almost done. Next, master anger impulses. You know, that's where the enemy gets his power from. It says in Ephesians 4.26, And don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sin go down when you are still angry, for the anger gives the foothold to the devil. And Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 are important. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. The antidote to all anger impulses that do not give the devil a foothold is kindness, compassion, and forgiveness. And we should be marked by those three things in the church. We should be kind to one another. We should be compassionate to one another. We should forgive one another. Because when we do, we we exemplify God's grace. Can you imagine that? God's grace. Last thing. And then you go to lunch. We need to fill the house with Jesus. We need to fill the house with Jesus. What that means is your heart. You need them in your heart. There's some sobering words that Jesus said in Luke 11. It says, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest. But when it finds none, it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. 
and they will all enter the person and live there. And so the person is worse off than before. Folks, I'm going to tell you something, and it's been in my experience over the years. Don't try to combat the enemy. Don't try to be free from an addiction. Don't try to get rid of your anxiety and depression and and anger and all of that stuff when Jesus is not in the house. Because it is only through Jesus being in your life that you're going to succeed. I can do all things through myself. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I can't do it within myself. I need Jesus in the house. You practice these things. You put the word in you. You put Jesus in you. You stay in biblical community. You stay strong in the word. You learn it every single day. And you fill your house with Jesus. So when you do spiritual warfare, <laughs> guess what? The devil can't do it. He can't come back. You're all filled. Folks, we don't have to fight the enemy. We just have to find Jesus. I'm telling you, don't focus on him. He gets the glory whenever you do that. Don't focus on what the enemy is doing in your life. Let's stand. Don't focus on what the enemy is doing. Recognize it and be aware. But put Jesus in the house. Amen? Put Jesus in the house. All right? It's a sobering message. But I want you to understand that we are really in a fight. I really struggle when people just want peace. We just want to live a peaceful life. God is peaceful. But Timothy has told us in the last days there will be terrible times. The earth has to shake. We have to be judged as a nation. Because if we are not, there's no God. But his time is coming. Where everything that we are doing, collective, uh, individually and collectively, is going to come to maturity. And we're going to have to give account to what we've done. Amen? But the good news is Jesus is here. He's in your hearts. Now, let me just say this. If you want to know this, Jesus, it is so simple. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, it's just as simple as saying, remember me. Do you remember the thief on the cross? He's about ready to die. And he looks at Jesus and said, remember me. And Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's such a fascinating thing. So he is there. It's just simply coming in. You know, we have a sinner's prayer. It says, Lord, just come into my life. I am a sinner. I want to serve you. I want you to be the Lord and Savior of my life. It's just a heart thing. It's not the word you say. It's just saying, Jesus, I want you here. Now, if you are a believer and you have Jesus in your heart, uh, what I want you to do is make sure that you continue to fill every room. (laughs) God is a God of light, and he's going to come in, and he's going to want to take every closet, every room that you've not allowed him access to, because the enemy's playing around there. He's in that little dark room, and he just wants it. You just go in there every so often, and I just play with it. But Jesus wants the whole house. Let's give him the house. What do you think? Let's give him the whole house. Amen? Work on that. Do not be led astray. Master your anger impulses. Don't let the enemy come in and take over. And don't talk to him. Talk to Jesus. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because I figure Jesus got more power. And he can rebuke whatever it is that you need rebuked. So let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, we're just thankful for this time. And I just pray, Lord, as we've extended this a few minutes, Lord, I pray that you would just ignite our church. Ignite every person in this room. Give them encouragement, Lord, that we are not trapped. 
by whatever it is that we face. That yes, we may have to fight a battle to get past it. We may have to fight a battle to be able to continue to win the victory. But we have a commander in chief. We have one like you that will never leave us or forsake us. And you will continue to win in every battle that we have. Now, we know, Lord, that is your will will be done as well. And the way that you do it may be different from what we think. But you will always be with us. You are always faithful. Walk with us, Lord, this week. Deliver us. Help us to be aware of what the enemy is doing. Not to glorify him, but to glorify you. Because we have demonstrated the power differential. You are a great God. Help us to serve you more, Lord. We honor you today. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.